On this special edition of the Modern Dealer Podcast, David and I traveled all the way to Las Vegas for the NADA show. We met with a ton of great industry experts, including this chat with Terry O'Laughlin, the Director of Compliance for Reynolds & Reynolds, and Randy Hendrick from Mosaic Compliance Services. Welcome in to the Modern Dealer Podcast. My name is David Farmer with Intice. And with me today is David Bertensini at NADA Las Vegas. How you doing, David? I'm always good. Just joining, uh, the, you know, NADA in Vegas. We are in the photo booth 360. You know me, I'm not a logo guy, but I'm wearing my 360 booth hat today because Jay was uh, nice enough to let us do the podcast from inside the booth. Can you believe we're here, David? This is so much fun, man. Go <laughs> <laughs> yeah. from Florida, we made it, made the podcast all the way out here to, to Vegas. And now we're sitting in this truck with these two awesome gentlemen that we're gonna go over and uh, do a quick little yeah. well, get to know interview, man, with we, these guys. We've had the opportunity to meet a few few different people so far here at NADA and really getting a really cool perspective of the automotive industry kind of outside of where we typically live on a day-to-day basis. Today, we're, we're, we're meeting with uh, Terry and Randy. Um, and uh, one of the things we like to do, uh, Terry, is uh, find out what your origin story is. What kind of brought you into the car business? Uh, and then uh, may maybe you give us that story a little bit and then we'd love to hear yours as sure. well. All right, well, I'd be glad to start. I've been an attorney for 39 years, 29 of these years, I've spent working in the car business. 16 of those years, the Ford Attorney General's Office where I investigated and prosecuted car deals. I didn't know anything about the car business until 1990. I was brought into a case in Palm Beach where there was a murder. And one evening, a beautiful part of the uh, Palm Beach area, a, a woman answered the door and was greeted by this person dressed like a clown. Wow. The clown gave the woman a bouquet of flowers, flowers, clown put a gun, shot her right in her own doorstep. Oh murder. my God. The husband of the woman who was slain was a car dealer. Oh my goodness, this, 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 this sounds is, like this Fargo. Is this a TV show? <laughs> I, 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 I think the only difference is maybe There's instead of a clown with a gun, it was a wood chipper, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways. Yeah, nice. Where's well, Nancy Grace? Yeah, yeah right? <laughs> yeah, where was Nancy Grace when you need her? I was brought in because I'm also an accountant. And okay. helped with the case because they found out that's the game. Dominator fraud, insurance fraud, other shady transactions. So I worked on those cases and the fellow went to jail for eight years. I became the receiver of the store and I handled collections and everything else. So all of a sudden I was thrust into the car business. Interesting. Now, now there is an interesting ending to this story, which is still going on. After all these years, 30 years later, 30 years later, they arrested the clown. Oh my gosh. And a cold case? It was a cold case and through DNA evidence, she she ended up marrying the, the, the car dealer and she's on uh, up for uh, on trial, which is supposed to begin next month. Wow. And they had her up for murder one. They just reduced it, so it, you know, the, the clown was a female? Clown, she was the <laughs> yeah, she was the repo lady for the dealer. Oh my oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's how it all connects. I was yeah, like, that is yes. incredible. I mean, that really would be a great story for a movie, I right? I think I've actually seen this on like 48, not 48 hours, but one of these murder <laughs> CSI shows right? my wife loves to watch, which yeah. starts to make bum, me bum, nervous. Bum. I'm just like, why are you watching this? And I'm like, oh boy. So that's that's a little nerve wracking, right? So, so that was my introduction to the car business. Wow, that is, uh, the, I, I, that, that is a unique story. I mean, most people say, you know, when I was a kid, I saw this car and I just fell in love with it, and I wanted to be in the car business. Well, so Adam, that's Adam was from the Fast and Furious. Know, right? our, our previous interview was just after yeah. the Fast. And He's Furious. an attorney as well. Yeah. yeah. Now, what's so funny? I've, I've been working running for rentals now for thirteen years, and I still get calls from the attorney general's office because I became a car guy for all the complaints from I the bet. entire state. Right. And they, they send these letters to the attorney general, my name, car complaint department. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. You and the Google review, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What a great story. What a great story. Let's right? hear yours. Well, I, I know have... you got a high bar. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't have any got murdered. <laughs> I didn't have a clown in my career, but I started my career as a litigator in New York 
City and went over to become a consumer credit lawyer in 1983 when GE Capital hired me to do mobile home financing. Wow, okay. And that makes auto dealers look like the Sisters of Charity. Wow, really? Yeah, so I've never really had much uh, interaction with anybody in the mobile home industry. Well, that's, so, that's better off for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, but it was it was a booming business in the mid-80s. Then yeah. it went bust with the recession in 87. I moved over to do credit cards. Okay. Uh, I then went to uh, Citibank, where I did credit cards and bank regulatory matters. Then I went to MasterCard International, and from there I went to Dealer Track okay. in 2004, yep. and that's where we built a compliance product. I wrote their compliance guides, spoke to some data conferences, mm -hmm. and um, loved, and loved the automobile business from the day I got into it. What's so cool about the automotive industry, and this is something that we're kind of because we started the Modern Dealer Podcast and we're getting these opportunities to have conversations with people like you, it really has broadened the awareness of all of the different aspects of automotive and how large an industry is. You know, David and I, we go back to selling cars back in the 90s. I was a, a car dealer before that at a, used car, a small used car dealership real close to the same area. And then I grew up in the car business. So, I mean, I was kicking around Minneapolis auto auction when I was five years old. You know, I was detailing cars when I was 11, you know, wow. sweep, sweeping the floors in a Lincoln Mercury dealership you know, when I was 13. So that's kind of what my my background is. And um, I, I've always had a passion for this industry, but the Modern Year Podcast really puts us in such a cool position to be able to talk with the, you know great people like you and hear all these great stories, but more importantly, to be able to see how far reaching uh, the industry really is. Right. Um, so um, so you, you're both work, you both work for Reynolds and Reynolds now, is that no, correct? No, I work for my uh, own consulting business. Okay, you're with Randy Henrik and Associates. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. But you, you, but you were at uh, well, the Reynolds director, and Reynolds. director. And so you know, uh, we were talking um, uh, the, the the last segment, the last guest that we had was a younger younger attorney, and he works with car dealers, providing uh, uh, consultation around uh, not just TCPA but uh, other regulations sure. and compliance as well. So Reynolds and Reynolds, as a company, you do business with thousands upon thousands of dealerships and from a compliance standpoint since in those dealerships that you're doing business with that's where they're, they're getting their forms and that's how they're printing their forms and that's i am in charge of forms yeah all and there are 39 feet of documents for every automobile transaction and all those documents have to work together in the interest of the dealer yes exactly and, that, and that, that's a, that, that's exactly where i was getting to right now is like there, there's so many different aspects where dealers have to be aware uh, of compliance to make sure that they're protecting the dealer, which is, you know, one of the first things that, you know, we're, we're trained as an F&I manager, yep. that my first responsibility is to protect the dealer. Yep. Um, and I think that's been dealer's drilled. assets. Yeah, yeah. Right? right. And that is, that, that is, that is so important. Not, not an easy task. <laughs> not an easy task. I mean, it's like it's a moving target, right? In a lot of ways it is. I mean, the, the, and the reason it's such a moving target is that legislation changes on a daily basis, or interpretations of legislation and changes on a daily basis. There are lawsuits that change, regulators uh, change, yeah. language and yeah. so forth. Because you know, it's good, better, and best. You want to continue to monitor your documentation to make sure you're prepared for all the contingencies that could happen. So also, you also need continuing education yes. on what's going on in the, in the compliance world and what new traps there are out there. Yeah. TCPA is a good example. Of now we have this California privacy. Exactly, that's becoming which is, extremely which important. Is a nightmare. Yeah, and I understand Washington State just passed a similar law. So where we're headed is dealers having to comply with multiple state privacy laws and manage their customer data, which is really their number one asset, in ways that may make it impossible to comply fully. Yeah. Even to follow up on that, you know, the, the privacy notice that the Federal Trade Commission changed a few years ago. On the website, you can wear the privacy notice. There are actually 288 versions of that same privacy notice. So dealers have to be really careful. So, no, you know, the commissions are with other fellow dealers, yes. and their organizations. How how they interact with their privacy issues, what they can reveal internally, yep. what they can reveal to third parties. So, no, I mean, I, even I, I, I recently did a privacy notice for a California dealer. 
it was like eight pages. Yeah. Wow. And, and I tried to keep it as simple as I could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you have to include all of those uh, the, those those different aspects to make sure that there is compliance for a dealership. And and, and you know one of the things that we talked uh, with Adam about, and I think it's extremely topical to chat with you guys as well, is that the dealership group that uh, that we work for was acquired by Auto Nation early days ninety eight ninety nine. And you know it's a big publicly traded corpor corporation. I'm sure they probably got a hundred attorneys making sure that they are in compliance, and they're working with good organizations like Reynolds or Reynolds to make sure they they have all of those, those things that are in compliance. But but it, I think that where there is um, some challenges is if you look at some of the smaller dealers, the mom and pop or right. the one and two uh, dealership, they don't have access to a hundred attorneys, you know, pushing down. So I think maybe that's where. Uh, you know, making sure that they're leveraging and, and aware of their relationship with companies like Reynolds or Reynolds, or or even understanding that there's people like you out there that they're that they can consult with. Well, one and, one of the things I did when I was at Dealer Track is we developed a compliance product for dealers that would give them the forms, the systems, and the best practices to manage basic dealer compliance on a federal level. Everything from red flags to adverse action notices to record keeping on pulling credit bureaus and adopting the native form for fair lending. And we would do monthly webinars mm -hmm. with dealers to keep them apprised of new things that were going on and give them the systems they needed to do that. Definitely not as sexy as, you know, trying to figure out how to sell more cars, right? right? <laughs> it, but, it's, but it's so important. And, and it kept a lot of dealers out of trouble. Yeah, I bet. And I, I would say that, that uh, dealers should not be reluctant to call upon their business partners, handle the DMS, mm -hmm. ask them questions, and find out what they're doing to make sure they're protecting the dealer's interest and all the information that could come from uh, Randy or, or people that work in the industry on the legal side. Yes. They can be very helpful to, to smaller dealers, especially. Yeah. The small dealers have the biggest challenge. They do. I and, think so. And that's why we're developing programs to outsource mm -hmm. uh, as much of that as we can. Yeah. The uh, no, no, the, um, no, I was going to ask, uh, I know that they've got a, um, a workshop today and we're talking about uh, used cars and such, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a, the photo booth's yep. uh, uh, rig rigidity uh, test they're doing, yeah. <laughs> but um, tell us uh, maybe one of the highlights of, um, of the workshop there today. Well, it, the workshop's actually on Monday, but what, what we're going to be talking about is principal compliance risks in used car selling everything from the used car buyer's guide mm -hmm. to warranties to titles to odometer fraud um, when you can disclaim warranties when you can't and some collateral issues like advertising mm -hmm. um, and other things that come into the used car title market. branding title branding. Nature, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah there, there are a whole list of uh, issues that are distinct from new vehicle sales that used exactly used car sales have to Center. Yeah, and we want to make sure. Well, from a doc, I'm a document man, so uh, having a whole group of documents that address them. For example, the goodwill repair. Yep, that happens quite often. Right, you should document that. Make sure yeah. there's no misunderstanding between the consumer and the dealer. No right, because it could that that could then become an implied warranty if they're doing something for free without documenting yep. it. So right. the goodwill, right. correct? Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. 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 how the consumer is going to perceive it. Yeah. yeah. Guess what? You know, the, the concept is that, that you want to prepare in your deals to make sure that you are considering all the legal consequences and risks. So if you have them all documented, yeah. like for example, consumers come in, they trade their vehicle, and they're hiding uh, something that's wrong with the trade-in, right? Right. And well, why not have the consumer sign a document stating about uh, this car it has these issues issues or right. not mm -hmm. and if it says no issues whatsoever well guess what you find yeah. out later when you that there's a problem and, and the consumer knew about it, the consumer is a perpetrator of fraud on the dealer and that the perpetration of frauds on dealers is a growing phenomenon 
So they're the kinds of issues viewers should consider. Yeah, absolutely. It's so much so like issues. a form you would sell when you sell your house, a, a seller's right. disclosure statement. That's right. When yeah. you're selling your home, they ask you, like, you know, is anybody murdered here? The yeah. house gets fired. Right. Is there anything? Are you in a sinkhole? Yeah. You know, things like that to ask the customer, which would protect the dealer more. Yes. You know, for a dealer. Right. I mean, is there forms? Is that in existence right now? Oh, yes, it is. Okay. Spot deliveries are another issue. issue. Spot deliveries, yeah. Um, T Terry's company puts out a great acknowledgement of rewritten contract where the customer acknowledges that they've signed a contract that may not be financeable and that if that's the case in 10 days, whatever it is, either side can undo the deal um, by bringing back the vehicle and seeing if it can be changed to another arrangement or just getting back the traded car and walking away. Yeah. So here's an interesting uh, idea just to chat about. So one thing about the Modern Dealer podcast that we like to focus on is how the business is changing, how it has changed, and how it continues to change. One of the, and specifically since you guys are here talking about used cars, used cars is an industry that is under more change than I think any, any area uh, in automotive right now, when we start to look at companies like Carvana, CarMax, True Car, um, a lot of these other online retailers, Vroom, um, just to name a few, but they're changing the way that the customer interacts with uh, the dealership. And in some cases, you have dealerships that are crossing state lines, which we talked about uh, previously yeah, uh, and making sure that even if you're an Ohio dealer you got to be concerned about selling a car to somebody in right. California because now not only are you uh, uh, it, it, you have to be in compliant with the Ohio laws but you also be compliant with the California laws as well but in, in regards to um, the, the online transactions where companies like Carvana might bring a vehicle to a consumer and complete the transaction and or purchase a vehicle uh, from a consumer, not at a physical uh, retail location, or maybe not even in the same state. In, in 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 the business that you're in, is there anything that dealers, you know, how is this affecting the automotive industry right now? Is there is there certain, certain things that you guys are are seeing? Is it is it just is it so new that there's that that we're just kind of figuring out as we go? Well, a few issues. One, uh, the documentation once again should have language in there about choice of law but consumer transactions usually are based on where the consumer signs it so if you are a Georgia dealer selling a car to a sold in Florida it's where the consumer signs it in theory so you are extending these those are called long arm statutes but choice of law should play a key role in all this now and the choice of law should always be where the dealer is located that's what you would argue mm -hmm. because right. you you want to have if there's litigation you want to be right more here yeah district as opposed to yeah well you also can't work all the time though you're going to try that yeah um but there's what's happening now in remote sales is that much in common you know the electronic world mm -hmm. where you are agreeing all these terms online yeah but there still has to be a signing ceremony of some type and here's where the legal world really hasn't caught up with the, the, the remote selling world yes and even if you transact someone in georgia selling the dealers in florida there has to be some kind of transaction signing now there are, are, are solutions to this. There are remote selling modules. That actually, someone comes to the, someone's home and they sign right there. Um, but it can be done uh, electronically and all kinds of other ways. But that's the problem. Dealers have to be really cognizant of they're selling a car across state line. How do they protect themselves? With the sales? That's what I, I think we're moving in a direction of completely electronic remote sales. Yes, uh, definitely will be. And the dealers will have to understand what's required to do that. You have to give a notice and get a um, reasonable assurance under the e-sign act mm -hmm. to do business with a consumer electronically. But dealers should think about their forms and have a checklist of forms that have to be completed and signed by the consumer with an electronic signature and appropriate security to do as far as they want to do the, the document signing online. Mm -hmm. But there does need to be a physical delivery of the vehicle, and there needs to be documents signed in connection with that and, as well. And at, the, the, at the point of the Georgia dealer again, are you using Georgia, Georgia documents or mm -hmm. are you using Florida documents? Remember, consumer law is based upon where the consumer sits, generally speaking. Right. And so the conflict is 
we've got to use Florida Doc. Then you raise all kind of taxation issues, mm -hmm. right? So there, it's a very complicated process. And yeah, the taxation issues are very much up in the air. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's it, a lot of times it's just how you interpret it, right? It's yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think anything you can do, at least on paper, to localize the transaction in the dealer's home state, and even put that on, on your buyer's order, this transaction will not be completed until the documents are signed by the dealer and the customer takes physical possession of the vehicle, which could be to a transport company sure. in the dealer's home state. Yeah. I think that helps. Is it foolproof? No. Mm -hmm. But I think you've then done everything you can to localize the transaction. Yeah. So the customer takes title, takes possession, uh, constructive possession through a shipper at the dealership. Yeah, why don't you explain constructive possession? Constructive possession means that they're the customer is not there, mm -hmm. but they're the ones who are hiring the transport company to take their vehicle to their home in Florida. Gotcha. So the transaction literally takes place and is completed in Georgia because the last signature is that of the dealer. And the customer is then titled the vehicle and takes possession of it through the uh, shipping company. Right. Yeah. A lot of moving parts, that's for sure. And what's so interesting, too, is you just think about how consumers want to um, want their transaction to be fast, easy, and they uh, want home delivery. Home delivery. Yeah, I mean, that's we're going to be seeing a lot more yeah. of litigation issues. There's going to be a lot more issues coming up with these home deliveries, and we're trying to get dealers. David and I, as being a modern dealer, trying to get dealers to move towards doing business that way and making it more convenient for the consumer to actually for dealers to have a tool to be able to transact online and have the dealer deliver the vehicle. You know, one of the problems with that, however, is dealers won't have a chance to sell ancillary products, now voluntary protection products. Um, getting the consumer to come to the store has tremendous marketing advantages of sure. doing something remotely. Uh, moreover, there have been studies uh, done that some millennials prefer actually doing it in the store. Yes, mm -hmm. so, we agree with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think in, from our perspective, so my, so my company offers the technology to dealerships to allow customers to do really every aspect of the car shopping online, including looking at F&I products and educating themselves, sure. looking at the individual pricing based on the, the exact vehicle that they're looking at and comparing pricing and, and so on. Um, but really giving them the opportunity to do the shopping online, but actually promoting the transaction in the dealership showroom, which I think makes, uh, uh, you know, I, I, th I think still today in 2020, you know, the amount of customers that want to uh, start and complete their transaction online is still a very, very small number. It is. Um, yes. But it is going to be an that's area cool. that's going to be, that's going to change, now, it, you know. It, it's really interesting, um, Randy referenced UMIDA, Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, that's state law. That was promulgated uh, generically in 1999. Uh, Eastside, I mean, federal. yeah, was federal. That was the year 2000. Now wow. You figure, that's 20, 21 years ago. We already had the law in the books for electronic transactions. Yeah. It's still such a small percentage. Yeah. It's an interesting yes. because the dealer community doesn't always move along real quickly in yeah. adopting. But once it starts adopting it, yeah, it's like a landslide. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, just from a from an automotive standpoint, I think sometimes it takes the technology to actually become a, a mass adopted. You know, look at you know electric vehicles, for example. You know, we we were selling Toyota Priuses back in ninety eight, ninety nine when they yep. first came out, exactly. and it was a very small amount of people that were even interested in that. Now, but now the technology has changed so much with Tesla Hello, and everybody Tesla. else. Oh, right. You know, now bringing out full electric vehicles and. And uh, it's just changing what people are, are wanting to buy in this automotive industry. But what is so cool about uh, this opportunity is to talk and get into conversations, you know, with industry experts, giants yeah. like you guys are uh, in your perspective spaces. It's very cool for us. We they really, really appreciate it. And yeah. We're very honored to be able to, to sit in this truck yeah. inside a booth, <laughs> inside the Las Vegas Convention Center. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully just, you know, give our uh, audience the opportunity uh, to just have a, 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 a quick chat Let's about see. compliance sure. to use cars and you know this industry that we all love. It's our favorite subject. <laughs> I bet it is. I bet it is. Well, that's why Thank I'm glad you guys are here. The opportunity yeah. And, uh, Thank you.
if anyone wants to get a hold of us for more specifics, we can I'm include your we, we, we can include your links in the show notes sure. uh, in this uh, so you'll be able to reach Perfect. out and ask any questions. That would cool. be, be great. And uh, we're there to help dealers. And it's a difficult Absolutely. task, but yep. there are, there are easier ways to comply than it first appears. You take yep. it in small steps. Yeah, right. and getting the right people on your team, right? Right. 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 Yeah. I'm going to be on the, the, the good side of compliance, not the, yeah. oh, shit, I'm already messed up on the good side of compliance. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's bad. That's yeah, a legal that, term. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the flunk with dignity approach. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, this is, this is so fun. I really appreciate it. So we're going to go ahead and get this thing wrapped up. So for David, David, David Terry, and Randy, that's, that's a wrap. wrap.